They called him Rock and Rollin', the Super Fan, the Rainbow Man. If you watched any major sporting event in the last 15 years, you've seen Roland Stewart in the background. Known to millions of people as the bearded guy with the rainbow-colored wig who holds up signs at sporting events that read John 316. He has become somewhat of a celebrity. Other than that, we don't know a whole lot about the guy. He travels around the country, uh, going from uh, place to place, uh, and just shows up at uh, major events. His name is Roland Stewart. He seemed harmless, but apparently he wasn't. He is wanted, armed and dangerous, and the feds say he's got a hit list. Mr. Stewart, why did you do it? Why did you do it? Get the word out for Jesus Christ. We're living at the end of the age. Were you going to harm her? Come back. Forget that, John. Big thing. Guys, come back. Kind of went overboard, buddy, but uh, come on. No harm. No harm. The Rainbow Man appeared at thousands of televised sporting events around the country during the late 1970s and 80s. He became famous just by being there, in the crowd, on television. In a country obsessed with fame and media, his story is oddly resonant. My name is Roland Stewart, which most people won't identify with. People, if you've watched sports over the last 14 years, I used to wear the rainbow wig on nationally televised sporting events, was known as Rock and Rollin'. After I was saved, I was known as John 316 because of the bedsheet signs that I hung in the stadiums. I was born in Spokane, Washington. Both my parents were alcoholics. I was unhappy because I couldn't have a normal childhood and I was shy and not able to, to, uh, to, to say what I wanted in life and I held that all in. My father died when I was uh, seven years old. I couldn't invite my friends over to the house because my mother became uh, totally depressed and was epileptic. In 1968, she uh, died in a house fire. The same year, my sister was strangled by her boyfriend. West Valley High School class of 1963. Friends remember Roland as awkward, the one who stole beer from the supermarket where he worked and offered it to the cool guys so they'd hang around with him. Years later, Roland wrote an autobiography that was never published and described himself like this. I was shy in high school, didn't date much. I was interested in drag racing and needed a loud car to make a statement for me. All my friends were rebellious and into drag racing. We all drank and had our own group. I had to get married to my first love and we had a beautiful daughter. I had a lot of experience in retail sales, so after a few years, I opened up my own speed shop, selling high-performance auto parts. I was a hard worker and put in 110%, so I ended up spending a lot of time at the races, or drinking. My wife was too young and hadn't had a fling at life, so she started running around. I was possessive and lost my temper. 
I've always watched television. All of us who were brought up in the generation from 1953 were, the TV was a babysitter, so it was uh, more of a child of the television age. And good to have you here. It is our pleasure. And to you folks at home, hello and welcome to The Price is Right. I used to watch shows like The Twilight Zone and uh, shows like that, shows that had a, uh, a message of uh, uh, learning something that was interesting or something that was, uh, could be uh, beneficial to me to, to know about and was exciting. My younger interests were not geared as they are today toward uh, current events and stuff like that. I watch Merv Griffin talk show and learn from the different stars, the ups and downs. So I studied the career of the Hollywood celebrity by watching the talk shows to hear the ins and outs. It was while watching TV one day in 1976 that a light bulb went off over Roland's head. Years later, he described the epiphany in his autobiography. Watching TV... I saw that I could be seen going to nationally televised events and create a personality that would be internationally known using the satellite dish. Instead of going to Hollywood and waiting in casting lines for years, I would be world famous overnight and do TV commercials, get paid for having fun, see the sports, get world attention, and have complete control over my life. NBA Finals, Game 5. I drove to Portland from Clee Ellum alone. Went into the stadium, and at halftime, I walked around the bottom aisle. A cameraman grabbed me and said, Stop. I'm going to make you world famous. I started jumping and dancing. He said, Hold on. Wait till you see the red light. Seconds later, on it came. And for seven seconds, I did what was to be known as my traditional dance for the red eye. Shaking my face, curling my long mustache, tossing my hair about, giving positive hand signs. V for victory, number one, thumbs up, and A-OK, -okay, while dancing wildly about. Once I saw the red light, I was hooked. I'm a very quiet, shy sort of person. But when I put on the rainbow and see the red eye, I become the most outgoing person in the world. After the game, went out to a hamburger stand wearing the hair, and a young boy and his father who had seen me on TV came running over and making quite a fuss. At that time, I began to see how people identify with someone they had seen on TV and what a great, positive, loving relationship it created. Nineteen seventy seven World Series, Game One, Los Angeles. Today I'll try sitting in an aisle right behind home plate so the center field camera catches me right behind the batter. I have my battery TV. What a trip. I can adjust my hair by looking in the monitor with 40 million people watching. I'm sitting in the aisle and no one is telling me to move and everyone knows I'm here. The whole world is watching. I make it through the whole game. I'm on every shot and I'm proud. Dear Sports Action, I am being bugged by a simple and insignificant thing. Can you help? Who is that fella with the multicolored hairstyle or wig that appears at all the sports? He always has a choice seat and must have the time and money to be at all those games. Now do you know who I'm referring to? Help him dying of curiosity. Mrs. Magna Chrisman Everett. Seattle Post, July 1st, 1979. 
Rock and Roland's excursions and television appearances are not capricious lark. They are part of a carefully planned campaign with an overall goal clearly in mind. That goal is to make Rock and Roland a rich man. The idea behind the whole impossible scheme is that if Roland can get on television enough times, he can establish himself as an entity readily identifiable with the great American public. Roland says, quote, I have invested $15,000 and received back over $5 million in primetime exposure over the past two years. My first commercial has just been released. people who make the sidelines a part of the show. This Bud's for you. This Bud's for you. It is a Budweiser beer commercial in which Roland is seen briefly rocking on the sideline at a football game and then flitting into the background in a closing scene. Hey, it's what you do. It's what you do. Yeah. I'm on my way to Los Angeles to get an agent, Roland says. By the time I do my third or fourth commercial, I figure I'll be worth a million dollars. This Bud's for you. Although Roland would never make millions, royalties from the Budweiser commercial did pay his bills for two years. During that time, he got an agent, flew to sporting events around the country, and lived the late 1970s high life. I began to see how shallow and unhappy the Hollywood high was by listening to different stars on talk shows, by meeting the people and personalities in person. Still enjoyed the attention, but was searching for what my calling would be. I wanted to know what my purpose was in life. It seemed that this was now a dead end. It was the Super Bowl in 1980 in Los Angeles at the Rose Bowl. I was wearing a fur loincloth that day and the girls kept putting their hand down in my, uh, b underneath the loincloth and uh, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of, uh, it was great in a sense in that that was great in a uh, sexual thing, but to me it became, uh, it, there's got to be more to life than just this. The Super Bowl is the ultimate sport. I had just done the ultimate high. I'd gotten on the Super Bowl, had all this attention, and it was, uh, I had seen that the, this could be, if this is the top of the ladder, then I had come to a dead end. Depressed after the game, Roland went back to his hotel room and turned on the television to cheer himself up. The channel was set to this show. And now, with his insights of current events as they relate to Bible prophecy, Dr. Charles Taylor. Greetings and welcome again to Today in Bible Prophecy. Those immense prophecies of the Bible that were written so long ago, thousands of years ago actually, back in the days of Moses and all the way on through, and they're coming to pass today just as God declared that they would be. Looking into the book of Ezekiel for a few moments today, Ezekiel the 38th chapter, the word of the Lord, God says, I'll send a fire in the land of Magog. There's going to be a nuclear war. Russians will be virtually burned up. It's all part of the prophecies of the Word of God. It's going to come to pass.
It hit me as this is the calling, this is the reality, this is what you've been looking for, this is what you're to do for, for the rest of eternity. By June of that year, I had liquidated everything I owned. I didn't want to prostitute myself by promoting products anymore, so I sold everything I owned, seven buildings, my mother's, grandfather's, and took off in my uh, pickup. I would live in the back of my car, would wake up and brush my teeth in a different uh, rest stop every morning, sleep in rest stops, and drove 60,000 miles a year for the next eight years. If there was a large news story like an oil spill or a, uh, some sort of a large story that I was near, like when Mount St. Helens erupted in, in Washington State, I drove, as soon as the first ash began to follow my pickup, I drove right around the, uh, the uh, ash storm and was over on the uh, mountain prophesying. Uh, using Monday Night Football, all the games, NBA Finals, NCAA Finals, World, World Series, Baseball, Monday Night Baseball, Kentucky Derby, Indy 500. Tonight, Roland is on his way to Detroit's Pontiac Silverdome for Monday night football with only one thing on his mind. Nielsen ratings. I don't care about the sports, double overtimes, extra innings, anything to extend the length of the event. Tonight, we hope they play till 3 in the morning because that gives me more chances to get on camera and spread the word. Hi. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Hi. Howdy. Hi. Hey, Hi. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, hallelujah. Same to you. <laughs> I've seen you on TV a whole bunch of times. Praise God, that's why I do it. I go to share a Christian message at all the televised events. Most sports fans recognize Roland instantly, and since his finances are limited, someone in the crowd usually gives him a ticket. Look, I see him at all the games, and I said, what the hell, give him the ticket, you know? You said he'd buy me a hot dog and a beer, and we'll call and leave him. Once inside the stadium, Roland begins to work the crowd. Hello, buddy. Hi. The Lord has given me a freedom to go into the world, to share a Christian message, reach the maximum number of people. It's a beautiful chance to share using God's given beautiful satellite coverage to every country of the world. After seven years of constant travel, Roland's finances are running low. He figures he has enough money for about three more years of travel. What happens when the cash runs out? The world situation is pointing toward World War III. Christ will come back before my... John 3.16, I would wear it on my shirt like this, and it states, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In the mid-1980s, Roland also married Elsie Hockridge, a school teacher he met at a Christian singles mixer in Virginia. Together, they traveled the country.
It's getting ready to happen. This could be the year. I don't know that it is or not. It's in God's hand. But God said this is the way it's going to happen, and that's the way it is happening. And this could be the time for the coming of the Lord. Would you be ready to meet the Lord if he came today? Listen, Jesus came into this world, first of all, to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to live the life that you couldn't live, that I can't live. In the mid-1980s, Roland began to sense that Judgment Day was near. God would rapture the church soon, meaning he would gather up all the Christians on earth and send them to heaven. Non-believers would be left to face years of war and destruction. With the end near, Roland sensed that God now wanted them to take the attention off themselves and focus it solely on the message. So they got rid of the wigs and went exclusively with John 3.16. Television did not welcome the change. And now, here is the star of the Price is Right, Bob Welcome to the Price is Right. appreciate that nice welcome. I appreciate it. And of course, my curiosity is aroused. Now, this is verse 316 of John, is it? And what is on her shirt? John 316. What does it, uh, what is verse 316? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It that is, is very nice. <laughs> that is very nice. but I don't understand why she has it on her shirt in the front row, The Price is Right. <laughs> Slowly, there we go, George. I'm a person who gives 110%. Whenever I do anything, I go to the maximum to get the job done. I played with Brooks for years, I think 18 straight Golden Gloves. I use a battery television when I'm in the event live so I can monitor myself so that the director couldn't cut my logo off. I could actually look at the side, look at the monitor, see how the shot was being cut, and then adjust the logo high, left, right, or left to make sure that I was in the proper time. They need a time of 101.24. Let's stay ahead of Lockman. Well, as I begin to change the, the message from Rainbow Head to the uh, John 316, the secular airways begin to uh, not care for my message because I was get, getting $10,000 a second airtime for free. So the directors began to try to shoot around me and uh, became quite upset with the presentation. Their whole life was beautiful tees and greens. So a lot of times I'd be invited out to the truck. One day, Larry Sorello for NBC picked me up on his golf cart where no one could hear us, took me out on the back nine and says that he had friends in the business who would break my legs if he ever saw me hold up my sign again. I don't think he should be promoting whatever he's promoting at a uh, sporting event like he does. You know, every sporting event you ever watch, you, ever, you see him always in the limelight. I just don't think that's right. At the end of the 1980s, Roland's life begins to come apart. His wife leaves him, claiming he choked her after she held up her sign in the wrong spot at the World Series. A drunk driver totals Roland's car, and his money is finally gone. The presentation is over. Roland finds himself homeless in Los Angeles. It is in Los Angeles that Roland begins to see that Judgment Day could come by the end of the year. God says I'll send a fire in the land of Magog. It's going to be a nuclear war. Russia will be virtually burned up. It's all part of Billions the of people will perish unless they repent. To I warn them, like Roland decides to create a new character, a character that will trick the media into broadcasting his message. Tonight, 
on hard copy. It's one of the strangest real-life stories television has given us. For years, millions saw him on television, carrying his message of Christian love and faith. Everyone thought he was just a harmless kook. But now the Rainbow Man is a fugitive, considered armed and dangerous by the FBI. I think his clowning days are over. I was always uh, under the impression that as we came to the end of time that the Lord would allow me one negative press. So I decided to create another character as I saw the shortness of time was coming to the end. I saw that if I was to create a backslidden Christian character, I had all these friends like Dr. Charles Taylor who were Bible prophecy teachers who weren't being interviewed. I wanted to get the press to go to the Bible prophecy teacher and interview him. The Rainbow Man is now wanted by the FBI for a string of bombings from Connecticut to California. Since then, police say he's been on the loose in Southern California, targeting churches, religious broadcasters, and newspaper offices, including this big Bible store in Garden Grove, California. We had a problem in our book section, and I went over there, and it, to me, it looked like the, the place was on fire. There's just a lot of smoke coming from um, our Bible room. And then um, we evacuated the store and called the fire department. Nobody knows what happened to turn rock and rollin' from a preacher of the gospel into a man who allegedly calls himself the Antichrist. But police say he has left some clues. I think the most telling uh, aspect of the story is the letter that we found in our lobby, uh, which is signed the Antichrist. He writes that the Bible is a lie, and he promises to work to wipe out those who preach the Christian message. The note even contains a hit list with nine names on it. I created a skunk oil stink bomb that I would let off and leave a note saying that I dislike the born-again Christian preachers who are preaching about the eternity and the rapture and your spirit being taken out and left the phone numbers of the prophecy teachers there. This was a way that I could get them, the press, to go to the prophecy teachers so they could expound on the shortness of time. If anyone has any information on this clown, call the Orange County Sheriff's Department. That's area code 714-647-7000. The initial part of the uh, backslidden Christian was to run with it until they found out it was me, and then I knew I'd have to get a fake green card and live in the Skid Row hotels. I couldn't drive or I'd get picked up and they'd be able to find me. Police say they hope to find Roland Stewart before he detonates any more devices and possibly hurts someone. They say they have a message too, that if he doesn't turn himself in, either they or the FBI will find him. Vicki Vargas, Channel 4 News, Santa Ana. Police in Los Angeles report they've arrested 10... I knew I had uh, to uh, be out a little bit more before I would end the presentation, so I lived in the uh, Pico area, Pico Union of uh, Los Angeles in the Skid Row hotels, walked everywhere, took uh, mass transit to uh, get to all the places that I was checking out to do my uh, final presentation when I would turn myself in and, uh, and uh, try to get the worldwide attention in a press conference. I have grown up in solitude my whole life, so it was not that hard for me because I had been accustomed to it and had prepared my life in a way so that it was all right. Alone in his hotel room, Roland spent most of his time, as he described it, getting fed by the media. Television for Los Angeles. Wake up each morning, hear the most current thing that's happened in the news. Then I hear my Christian speakers in the morning. Death and of hell. Then I go to Christian uh, 700 Club at noon. Christian uh, sermons up to 1 o'clock. And then I pick up on Geraldo, Donahue, Sally. And then in the evening, I can watch shows like 2020 and 60 Minutes, and Dateline and Inside Edition, and uh, Eat Entertainment Tonight, all the news shows. There seems to be a whole bunch of new reality shows that are coming in almost every night. 
the perception color is not in the black and white of statistics, but in the blood red of... And then I can finish off in the evening with the evening preachers, so I can be sermonized. Channel. Go 18 hours a day getting fed as I was when I traveled in my car. Gets me back into the uh, life of being fed uh, totally every day. Each person has a decision to make. You can either get saved and raptured, or you can ignore God's voice and get left to face World War III and the disaster to follow. Jesus is going to rapture the church soon, perhaps even on September 16, 1992. After the rapture, Juan Carlos of Spain will be revealed as the Antichrist and will lead the European common market in a one-world government. They chop off your head if you refuse to take the mark 666, the universal product code, on your hand or forehead. So Jesus told me to alert you my actions are justified in the Fifth Amendment, time of war, defensive necessity, a crime to prevent greater harm. September 22nd, 1992. Roland sets his final presentation in motion. Posing as a contractor, he picks up two day laborers in downtown Los Angeles and drives them to the airport Hyatt Hotel. They take the elevator to room 718, where Roland plans to hold the men hostage, but a maid is cleaning. In the confusion, Roland pulls a gun. There's a struggle, and the day laborers manage to escape. The maid locks herself in the bathroom, where there's a phone. She calls the police. Roland barricades the door, puts signs in the window for the reporters below, and demands a three-hour press conference. The rapture is six days away, and he's got to get the word out. He negotiates with police over the phone. Roland. Are you there, Roland? Roland, you know, we've, we've been on the phone now for quite some time, and, and you've been up upstairs for probably longer, longer than six hours. I know you've looked at the news on many occasions, and I've never seen a three-hour news conference, so your message is no way it's going to be three hours. I wanted it live. You know, that's really asking for something. I want all networks in our lives. National story, not a local story. Well, we're working on that. I can't make any guarantees as far as you talking to the press. Not at this point. If you, if you were to come out, uh, you and the young lady, then it would be no problem. I've watched the cops, you know, cop shows and tried to get a handle on what's going on. You know what, you know, really, so I tried to get an idea of just what you will do and what you won't do. But with all due respect, maybe you look at a little bit too much TV. I watch a lot of it. Well, you shouldn't look at it so much. It is good TV show. I watch all reality television. You know well, I, mean? I don't know. There's not too much reality on TV. No, I mean all real life situations. Shows like Current Affair, yeah. Sally, Jesse, Raphael. Right. Reality TV, there's a lot of shows on right now. Well, if that's, if that's the case, then, and you say you look at a lot of those real-time experience uh, TV shows, then you ought to know that nobody ever wins in a situation like this. After nine hours of negotiations, police still won't let Roland speak to the press. He watches the six o'clock news and sees that the final presentation has spun out of his control. Nobody's saying anything about the rapture himself in a hotel room to spread the word of God, making terrorist threats and holding a maid hostage. Now, could the content in the religious passages like John 3.16 explain what Stuart is doing and perhaps even why? Watching the news, Roland sees that the final presentation has failed. Despondent, he smokes a joint and weeps. Police seize the opportunity and throw a percussive grenade into the room.
Roland is stunned. Police kick down the door and arrest him. Okay, guys, now let's start moving back. Off to the side here so you can get the shot. He's going to be on that side. What are you doing? Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Get the word out for Jesus Christ. We're living at the end of the age. Right. Were you gonna harm her? Come back, we're here, that's the same guys come back. Kind of went overboard, buddy, but uh, come on, no harm, no. Come on, oh, scared thinking about you. Hey, the reason why I went down there. The self-proclaimed rainbow man with a multicolored wig and religious signs at sporting events wanted to shout from the scripture one more time. But before Judge Robert O'Neill could sentence him today, Stewart launched into a religious tirade. I mean, the eternity of the world is at stake here. We're living at the end of the age. The Bible says that people are going to die in a nuclear holocaust. Judge O'Neill then ordered deputies to remove Stewart from the courtroom. Don't take me out, I said. God said he's loved the world. Forgive them, Lord, for they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing, Lord. During the struggle, Paula Chan, the maid that Stewart held hostage in the hotel, left the courtroom in tears. Back inside, Stewart continues to struggle and quote scripture, even as a half dozen deputies carry him out a side door. After calm is restored to the courtroom, Stewart is sentenced to three life terms in prison. I gave my best to try to make this presentation. Of course, I don't like being here. It kills me to not to be out there doing the work. Three life sentences for someone locked in a bathroom for nine hours is ridiculous. I didn't anticipate that at the time, but I understand it now. The society is uh, bigoted toward Jesus Christ, and I'm their scapegoat. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming. September 6th. We're living at the end of the age. All right. Get saved. Get your heart with Jesus and have eternity in heaven, not in hell. Today's the day. You could die in an accident. Your choice could be over. So we got to preach it like today's the day. person on the yard could get shanked today and their choice would be over. Today's the day. <laughs> 